This video is about the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. And before we get to the Bohr's model, we're going to cover some of the models for the atom that existed sort of before that. So originally, uh, John Dalton probably thought of the atom as just a small, indestructible sphere. And maybe they weren't all spheres. Maybe they even had different shapes. He, we know that he thought that they had different sizes and different masses, which they do. But um, we know now that they're not indestructible. And one of the first um, experiments, set of experiments that got at the idea that the atom was not, in fact, indestructible, uh, was the experiments by J.J. Thompson, who was uh, working with electricity and cathode ray tubes. And um, he was able to discover the tiny particle that we now know as an electron. And he discovered a couple of things about the electron. First off, he knew that it had negative charge. And he also was able to measure its charge to mass ratio, or mass to charge ratio, one of those two. They're inverses of each other. And found that it was, a very, that it was consistent with the uh, particle having a very, very tiny mass, much less than the mass of a typical atom. So um, he discovered that the electron was then part of all atoms. So whenever he did experiments and he changed different elements around um, as part of his cathodes, he would get the same results. So these fundamental particles had negative charge, they were very uh, low mass, although he couldn't measure the mass independent of the charge. And um, he also knew that atoms were neutral overall. So when he put all this together, he envisioned that the atom might look something like this picture that I've shown here. So the little red circles that are in the middle here, let me get a colored pen. It's the little red circles that are here. Let's imagine that those are the electrons. So I've drawn the little minus sign inside the circle to indicate the negative charge. So Thompson knew that atoms were electrically neutral overall. So that means that positive charge had to offset any negative charges that were present. So he imagined that the positive charge, because he had not yet seen positive particles, was kind of smeared out as this uniform goo. And uh, being the good Englishman that he was, he likened it unto a famous English dessert, something called plum pudding, which isn't actually pudding at all. It's kind of a cake, but it's filled with little bits of fruit. And so he imagined the, the electrons were kind of like the little bits of fruit, and that the positive charge was kind of like the cake that enveloped the whole atom. And so this was Thomson's model. This was the model that Ernst Rutherford began working with when he considered his gold foil experiment. And we've already studied a little bit about that. If you recall, um, Ernst Rutherford uh, designed this experiment where he was shooting alpha particles. And he didn't quite know what an alpha particle was, but he knew it's a mass to charge ratio. And he also knew that it had positive charge. So he was shooting it at a really thin fo uh, foil of gold. And he knew that gold atoms were fairly big and heavy. And he also knew that um, gold atoms, he, he could make the gold really thin. And so he expected that most of his alpha particles would pass straight through, being heavy and positively charged. And most of them did. But a few of them ricocheted. And what would make them ricochet, he, he wondered. Well, you would need a lot of positive charge, because like charges repel each other. So he then begin, began to envision that um, all of the positive charge was then concentrated in the nucleus. And so the nucleus then was comes from the Latin word meaning tiny nut. So he imagined that there's this tiny nut of positive charge in the middle. And then the electrons, which I'll draw as these little tiny red dots, were somewhere outside of the nucleus. And that most of the atom was, in fact, empty space. So um, the space in between the electrons and the nucleus, according to Rutherford, didn't have anything in there. So there's this little tiny bit that was very uh, densely packed positive charge. And then the negative charges were kind of around that. And so that's kind of Rutherford's idea. But you may be wondering, as did many scientists, OK, if these electrons here have negative charge, right? Why don't they feel an attraction towards the nucleus and simply wind up sticking on top of the nucleus? Well, that would mean that the atom collapses. And that would mean that the whole atom would have about the same size as the, the nucleus. And that wasn't the case, right? Atoms are bigger than the size of the nucleus, according to the gold foil experiment. So we have to have some way of keeping those electrons um, outside of the nucleus so that we can create this space. And of course, physicists have a good idea how to do this because they know about planetary motion. And uh, the moon is attracted to the Earth because of gravity, a force of gravity. And um, so they would imagine that maybe the positively charged nucleus, that the electrons, and we'll draw something simple here. We'll draw a simple hydrogen atom, which has one proton. 
and one electron. So there's our proton in the middle, and here's our electron out here. So we might imagine that this um, electron is in orbit around the nucleus, just like the moon is in orbit around the, uh, around the Earth, even though there's gravitational attraction that should be pulling the moon towards the Earth. This wonderful prop property of orbital motion allows that orbit to remain stable. So you might imagine that something like this was going on um, with a hydrogen atom. Well, one of uh, Rutherford's students, a man by the name of Niels Bohr, comes along, and he's been thinking about these ideas. And he's also been watching closely, that's Bohr, B-O-H-R, been watching closely the work of Einstein and Max Planck and uh, their work with light. And so there was this idea out there at the time that energies of things like light might behave a little bit like particles and be quantized in these little fixed packets that uh, they came to call photons. So energy can only be in fixed packets. So he, that, this was on Niels Bohr's mind. And Niels Bohr, when he looks at a model like this, he knows a couple of things. So one thing that he knows is that the theory of electricity and magnetism predicts that any time you have a charge, like this electron here that is moving around, it's going to produce a moving magnetic field. And Bohr knew that whenever you have a moving electric field and a moving magnetic field, well, that's what electromagnetic radiation is. That's light. And Bohr also knew that light carries energy. And he had seen the work of Einstein and knows that there are these little packets of energy. So if this electron was in fact orbiting around the nucleus, as we might propose, then based on the theory of electromagnetism, it should be giving off light. Well, light is energy, and so as it gives off light, I'll draw, draw a little wavy line here to indicate light coming off. So light's coming off here. So as it's giving off light, that's taking energy away. And Niels Bohr knew that you could not create or destroy energy. So if this electron is radiating energy, then it has to lose energy in some way. And one way that it might lose energy is for its orbit to decay. And so the electron, as it starts spinning around the nucleus, and giving off light, the more and more light it gives off, the more and more energy it loses, and the closer and closer it gets to the nucleus, until finally it collides with the nucleus. And again, we have the problem where the atom would appear to collapse. So we can't be consistent with the laws of electricity and magnetism and have an electron orbiting the nucleus. So that disagrees with older ideas of physics that uh, people believed in at the time of Niels Bohr. So Niels Bohr made kind of a radical proposition. He said, okay, for the hydrogen atom, let's assume that we've got our proton in the middle. And then Bohr said, okay, let's imagine that there are orbits around this nucleus, and these are the only orbits that the electron can be in. What that does is that fixes the energy of the electron. So this orbit might be a possibility, and there might be one that's further away from the nucleus, maybe out here. So I'll try to draw another circle. My circles don't look very circular, but you get the idea. And we can keep on drawing orbits around the nucleus. And so each one of these orbits, and Bohr actually gave them numbers, so we're going to call it n equal 1. We're just going to label the different orbits n with numbers. So we're going to call them orbit 1, orbit 2, orbit 3, and so on. We could keep on going, adding more and more orbits here. So the electron, Bohr said, can be on this orbit, n equal 1, or the n equal 2 orbit, or the n equal 3 orbit, but nowhere in between. So this solves the problem with the electron radiating energy as it moves around and collapsing into the nucleus. Why can't it do that anymore? Because it simply can't get any closer to the nucleus than this orbit. So it seems like a crazy idea, but in Bohr's time, he was thinking about the idea that energy could be uh, quantized and fixed in these certain amounts. And he might imagine that that's happening here with our little electron right there. So being in this ring, it's going to have a different energy than if it were in a ring that were further away from the nucleus. So if an electron were up here, that would be an electron in the hydrogen atom that has more energy. And so the only way that it could change its energy is sort of to hop from uh, ring to ring. Now, Bohr's model, Bohr was able to attach some mathematics to this and uh, say something about the force of attraction between the electron and the proton. So that's using Coulomb's law, which says that the force of attraction between any two charged particles, the force F, 
is equal to the charge on particle one, and let's call particle one the proton in our nucleus, times the charge on particle two, and let's call particle two our electrons, so I'll put a subscript E on there, divided by the distance between them squared. And so using this force, and thinking about the uh, force required to keep this electron in orbit, he equated those, and he quantized the um, something that's a little bit complicated, the orbital angular momentum, and he came up with an equation for the energy of the electron. And so Bohr said that the energy, he calculated the energy of this electron, he said the energy of this electron depends on the orbit. So I'm going to put a little subscript N on this formula. And it equals negative, and there was a whole bunch of constants that I'm just going to lump together into something called A, but A has buried in it things like Planck's constant, and the charge on the electron, and um, the speed of light, so some other constants like that. And then it was divided by n squared, so it depends on which orbit you're in. So we need to put in these different orbital numbers, one, two, three, and so on. All right, so this means that the energy can only ever take on fixed values. And when that happens, we say that the energy is quantized. So quantized is related to that word quantity, so it means that there are fixed quantities, and those are the only things that are allowed. That's in contrast to the term continuous. And up until the work of Planck and Einstein, most physicists believed that energy was continuous, that it could take on any possible value that it wanted, that you wanted it to have. So for example, kinetic energy is energy of motion. And so if you want an object to have, like a baseball, to have a little bit more energy of motion, you just need to throw it a little bit faster. So it can take on any energy depending on how far, it, uh, how fast it gets hurled. A little uh, diagram might help explain the difference between quantized and continuous energy. So imagine that we've got a staircase and a ramp. So your height above the ground, if you're a person walking around, on the stairs you can only take on fixed height values. So you can be on this step or any of the other steps, but nowhere in between. Whereas if you're on a ramp, a ramp is continuous and you can have any height that you want by moving up or down the ramp a little bit further. So that might be an analogy about the distinction between quantized versus continuous. And so Niels Bohr was proposing in the hydrogen atom that energies were quantized. And so they were quantized with this formula right here. And Bohr was able to come up with a value for this constant. So A is equal to 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So what makes a model really useful is that you can make predictions off the model and then test those predictions experimentally. So if we go back and think at Bohr's model, crazy as it sounds that only these fixed orbits are available um, and these fixed energies are available. Let's imagine, as Bohr did, what might happen if the electron changes energy. So the, if the electron changes its energy and, for example, hops from this n equal 1 orbit up to this n equal 2 orbit, well, it has to absorb that energy from somewhere. Let's imagine that it absorbs that energy from light. So from experiments, we have seen that hydrogen atoms absorb light energy of only certain wavelengths, and they give off light energy of those same wavelengths when they emit light. So here's a little wavy line coming in. Let's imagine that that's a photon, a little particle of light, and it has a certain energy, and it has exactly the right amount of energy to cause this electron to hop from this first ring to this second ring. Well, Bohr was able to calculate what that energy was. So let's imagine that we can calculate the difference in energy, delta E. Now this letter right here is the capital Greek letter delta, and chemists use it whenever we're taking a, a difference between two things. And it is always the final minus the initial. So this is going to be the energy of the final state, which I'll abbreviate with an F here, minus the energy of the initial state. So delta always means difference. So there's the minus sign, so we're taking a difference between the final and the initial states. All right, so what's the final state here? Well, the final state's going to be the energy when it's in orbit number two. And the initial state, well, that electron was starting out in orbit number one. So it's absorbed some energy and made a hop, we might say a quantum leap, from orbit one to orbit two. Now, using Bohr's formula, we can actually calculate what that is. So we're going to factor the minus a out front. And then the energy for E2 would be minus A over N squared. So we're going to factor it out the minus A. And so now we've got the N squared. So what is N? N is 2. 
and two get squared. We're going to subtract from that minus a over n squared, but we factored the minus a out, so that's going to be minus one over one squared, because we're in energy level one. And then we can calculate what this result is. And so when we plug the numbers into this formula using the value of a that Bohr determined, we get this number, a value of positive 1.635 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. So uh, Bohr knew that the energy for this little hop, this little quantum leap, had to come from somewhere, right? So the electron had a lower energy here in the n equal one orbit. It absorbed that energy and hopped into the n equal two orbit, and that energy came from the photon. So Bohr says that this energy change, delta E, has to be equal to the energy of the photon that went in because energy cannot be created or destroyed. And Bohr had been following the work of Planck and Einstein, and so Bohr, Bohr knew that the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant h times the frequency nu. And Bohr also knew the relationship between frequency and wavelength for light, and so he substituted that in in place of nu. So we got h, Planck's constant, times c, the speed of light, divided by lambda, the wavelength of the light. So because we've already calculated the delta E value and H and C are physical constants that we can look up, we can solve this equation for wavelength. So we're gonna do that first by dividing both sides by H and C, so we get delta E divided by HC is equal to one over lambda. And then to calculate lambda, we just need to take the inverse of both sides of this equation, so HC divided by delta E is equal to the wavelength, lambda. So this would be the wavelength of one of the photons that would be absorbed by the hydrogen atom according to Bohr's model. And so Bohr can calculate this by plugging in the values of delta E that we calculated above and Planck's constant and the speed of light. And you get a value that's 121.6 nanometers. So if you just plug in the numbers up above, you'll get your answer in meters because everything is in terms of SI units, joules for energy. Planck's constant has units of joules times seconds, and speed of light has units of meters per second. So the seconds cancel out, the joules cancel out, and you're left with a wavelength in meters. And so we can just convert that into nanometers. So what's really cool about Bohr's result is that this in fact matched the experimentally measured wavelength of absorption. And in fact, by predicting other kinds of hops between electrons, so maybe the electron going from the n equal two to the n equal three, or from the n equal one to the n equal three, or the n equal three to the n equal four, any of those hops, Bohr could predict all the wavelengths that were observed for the hydrogen atom spectrum. So this is very convincing results that Bohr's model is at least getting something right. So we're able to predict the emission spectrum for the hydrogen atom. So Bohr's model was radical in its day because it presumed that the electron could only exist in these fixed orbits and nowhere in between. Now it turns out that Bohr's model, although very impressive, able to predict all these wavelengths for absorption and emission, cannot predict all of the properties of the hydrogen atom. And whenever you have an atom that has more than one electron, Bohr's model also doesn't work out quite well for that. So you can't predict the wavelengths of light for that model. So we needed a better model to come along. And so what we're gonna do over the next uh, few videos and in class is to look at the evolution of some of these models and ultimately getting up to the model that is currently used today, which is called the quantum mechanical model or the quantum theory model. So it uses a branch of physics that applies to very small things called quantum mechanics. So it's all based on this idea that energy is quantized.